Welcome especially to our Chicago public school students and teachers and all our students and educators who are attending. Thank you all for your support of the past, present, and future of American writing. We're here today to talk about a book that engages young readers with some of the ways they can work to fight racism, to dis dismantle the systems that maintain inequality, and to engage with the world in such a way as to become a better ancestor. The Young Readers Edition of Me and White Supremacy teaches teens and preteens how to take apart their privileges and prejudices and teach their peers to do so as well. Author Leila Saad is a globally recognized writer, speaker, and podcast host on the topics of race, identity, leadership, personal transformation, and social change. Initially offered for free during following an Instagram challenge under the same name, the Digital Me and White Supremacy Workbook was downloaded by close to 90,000 people around the world in six months before it became a traditionally published book. Layla's work has been brought into homes, educational institutions, and workplaces around the world that are seeking to create personal and collective change. She's joined by Caitlin McGaw, a writer, listener, and artist, a two-time Grammy nominee, an artist fellow, and a deeply committed partner for change. Caitlin believes radical imagination begins with the way we read, sing, and ask questions of the world with our children. She's the author of the recently released picture book, You Are Not Alone with co-founder of the Alphabet Rockers, Tommy Sulati. Thanks so much, Allison. Thank you, Allison. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Worldwide love right here for this exciting spark together. Um, just an honor to spend time with you. Um, I'm not a fan of your work. I'm an engager with your work um, mm. and an appreciator. And I felt an echo for many years of, of uh, questions and conversations. And one admiration point I just wanted to bring forward is the time you've spent articulating all these frameworks mm -hmm. for all of us. I just, I want to give you so much thanks. Thank you. I, I receive that. I fully receive it. And, um, you know, I talk a lot in my work about becoming a good ancestor. And I always just want to thank and acknowledge all of the all of the people who have come before us, who have created language for us and frameworks for us and um, perspectives and ways of seeing ourselves and see seeing the world that allow us to um, embody it first in our own lives and then share it with other people as well. So, you know, we are just, we are the generation that is here now. Um, we, we received the baton from those who came before us and we're gonna pass it on to those who will come after we're gone. Thank you so much um, for that framework and reminder. Um, I did want to ground myself as well in some mm -hmm. of my practices. Um, my name is Caitlin McGaw. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm here on the unceded Checheno Ohlone land in uh, Oakland, California. And I give appreciation to the indigenous communities here, um, the Black Panther community who continues to lead and instruct us on what we already know to be true about sovereignty and liberation. Um, so I give mm -hmm. thanks. Also lifting up the radical queer minds of the Bay Area who continue to provocate what's possible. Um, that is the community from which I come, even in my cisgendered, perceived to be white um, and white privileged experience, um, which I continue to unpack. Um, a little bit about why this spark is interesting. So I do come from a collective uh, of diverse anti-racist activists, movers, dreamers, and creatives. So, and I come as an individual, but I feel that um, especially being a white woman in this conversation with a global leader like yourself, it's important to kind of recognize that conflict of like, I might be the mm. one speaking right now, but I am who I am because of my community, just like you talked about that ancestor. Mm. Um, and I, that is where my gratitude is rooted. Um, mm. And we could talk about like, kind of how I got here, which is important because here we are to talk about an essential reading for young people right now, this toolkit. That's what it looks like to me. And that's what it felt like to me as I devoured mm. it, because I really did devour it. <laughs> um, so I imagine young Caitlin, 14 years old, starting my anti-racist journey. 
And that mm-hmm. began for me as a, a suburban Boston, Massachusetts uh, child with not much context for um, what we hold in this text now. Mm-hmm. And I participated in some anti-racism, intersectional youth spaces where we were there to unpack, understand, break up binaries and do all these work. And so I feel very um, fortunate in that I had a, an experience that decentered whiteness. It wasn't for white kids to do the work. It was for all of us to see how it interconnects. And mm-hmm. um, I'm really excited about how this book and your work for all of us is widening our empathy, investigating patterns, belief systems, and the evol- evolution, truly evolution of who we are as individuals through the generation. So I want to give thanks for this legacy work. Mm, thank you, thank you. Thank so, you for sharing your experience as well, because I think that is, I think that's such a gift that you had that experience. And at the same time, uh, I, you know, I didn't, you know, and so mm. many other kids didn't. Um, and so to, to write this book and be able to, like you said, provide this toolkit was like a gift to my younger self um mm. first and foremost right um, and then to my children and then to, to to young people around the world that's beautiful um the healing that is there um and i think mm. remembering how much healing of these experiences and i i give thanks that you've also shared your real experiences as a child is there anything from the book that you wanted to reflect on in this moment or call into this moment um of your your history as a young person unpacking things. I yeah so I was sharing just before we we came on that I I'm a third culture kid um and I was born and grew up in uh in Wales um in the UK um but my parents were immigrants so I was first generation and I've had I've I've been in I grew up in several different contexts I grew up in the UK as the only black and muslim kid in a predominantly white space and predominantly white and Christian schools. I lived for a short while in Tanzania, um, my, which is where my mom's from. We, we went for a couple of years back home, right? Um, and so I, I went to school in African schools, right? Where Swahili was the language that was spoken in English. Um, but all the kids were black like me, all the teachers were black also. Then I came back to the UK and then I came here to Qatar and finished high school here which is a truly international context um, that in some ways decentered whiteness just because the student body was so diverse, but in many ways still reinforced it because the teaching body and the leadership body was still very white, mm-hmm. right? And so I've experienced a range of different contexts um, as I was growing up and, you know, as we're growing up, that's when we're forming our identity, who we are, how we mm-hmm. see ourselves, how we see the world. and one thing that stuck with me throughout that entire time was this, which I only have the languaging for it now because of the work that I do, because I'm I'm an adult, um, but was this feeling of otherness, not fitting, not being right, something not being right. Mm -hmm. Um, Part of that has to do with being a third culture kid and just not really knowing where you belong. But part of it has to do with being a a black girl in an anti-black in a predominantly anti-Black world, um, in a context of white supremacy. And so in writing this book, I think it was this uh, love letter to myself. Um, It was me trying to make sense of my experiences and me wanting to say to myself, to my children, to other young people, who you are and how you are is exactly right. There There is absolutely nothing wrong with you. It is the world that is wrong, right? And so I wanted to be able to help them identify the lies of superiority and inferiority. And I wanted them to understand the context of power and that mm-hmm. privilege is, it, it comes because of power and a desire for power and to use power and to gain power. Um, and I wanted to really um, also be able to help facilitate conversations across these um, what we call as adult racial divides, right? Um, in, in For young people, it, that's my friend, you know? Mm-hmm. Yes, they're a different race than me. They're a different culture from me, but that's my friend, right? 
and yet they're not having necessarily those conversations about race, but other things they're seeing in the news yeah. about the, the, the way that history is taught at school and various other subjects. And I wanted to be able to um, give a toolkit to young people so that they can, at the age they're at now, have mm -hmm. these conversations with a sense of nuance and complexity, empathy, like you mm -hmm. said, and maturity and grow up to become the adults who can do that as well. Because what I saw so much with the work that I did with the adult edition was we can't even have those conversations because so many people who are white and who have white privilege have never been exposed to this level of conversation. You know, so to, to be able to talk with a person of color, a black person, and really acknowledge your privileges, really understand the way that the world centers you is just so difficult to do. Um, mm. And if they'd had these tools, and if we'd all had these tools early on, what right. might, how, how might it look different? And what might the world be? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting connection between um, a white, able-bodied uh, person's kind of fear and resistance to the work, and then mm -hmm. what a child may only be served, right, the, as a framework. Um, mm -hmm. In my experience in the schools, and we we have been anti-racist artists in schools for over a decade, um, is that young people's frameworks haven't been fully mapped. Um, mm. And that's why there is a real opportunity to speak that love and truth that you just spoke of um, and just water those seeds of, of deep connection to you are not alone, mm. to a legacy of understanding. Um, it is our job um, as artists on this time to kind of figure out new pathways and connections yes. for, the, for the generations of knowledge that have mm -hmm. been spoken already and just mm -hmm. find new ways to connect. And I think yes. the young people are, it's just been such a absolute delight um, to see how it, it lands, right? To show up and see the child who sits up taller because mm -hmm. they see a black woman on stage that looks like them and they say, mm -hmm. hmm, that's me, you know, but mm -hmm. they're in their own body. And sometimes it's not a, um, a mirror, but they see themselves. Right. And um, that's a really, uh, that in itself is a, is a marvel, but we have to do these con the context work. And that's why I'm that's really right. grateful for what you've done because um, children are sometimes given a very, um, and this is the world we walked into in children's media was be mm. kind and it's okay. Right. It's not enough. But really, right. if we get to the basis of, what kindness is, it's mm. radical, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. But if we don't kind of shake it all up so we can see what is really courage, yes. what is really love, yes. then it's kind of only giving a very, I'll just say like a whitewashed or white Absolutely. supremacist tone Absolutely. of belonging. And right. in kindergarten, they already know. Mm. So I know, I know this is for young readers, right? 14. Mm -hmm. But um, that's why we're connected. You know, we're trying our book, uh, You're Not Alone, mm -hmm. which we're not talking about today, but is for the like the, the forming minds to see someone in the pages that might spark them to think differently. Absolutely. And, um, Absolutely. Yeah, it's all connected. Mm. I did have some questions for you, which might be of interest to um, us movement makers. And, um, you know, when your first book was published in it's during the pandemic, right? Or the, it, no, or it was published right before, right okay, before. So right before. Yeah. So thankful we were still, that it. Yeah, I was able to travel. I was able to come to the American Writers Museum and do an event oh, right. there in okay, person. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So this is even more important because what we noticed um, over the quarantine and the kind of reception to Black Lives Matter in our country um, yeah. is that it did start shaking people's frameworks a little bit. Um, mm. Let's see what happens. I wanted to hear from you. Mm. What are some of the like victories that you mm. just want to celebrate? Because you know it's easy to like name the setbacks, and but yeah. I want to I be in your space of abundance. Like, let's celebrate the yeah. victories from your work. Do you, you know what? Um, the, immediately, what comes to mind for me is just what I'm seeing, both within myself, but also within my community um, is, is 
particularly from black and brown people, particularly from black people, especially in the in 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 the aftermath of the the 2020 protests and then that whole kind of um, we want to read all the anti-racist books and all all of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, what I have seen and what I have experienced for myself is that so many of us are really dedicated to um, our own joy and not waiting for white people to get it so that we can finally, you know, like breathe and we can finally feel free. Um, it was, it was, terrible the the event that sparked that those protests was horrific the fact that so many people were so many people who have white privilege were then interested in learning about anti-racism was important mm -hmm. and it also wasn't new mm -hmm. um because in the past when events like that have happened you see this uptick but then you very quickly see this you know, mm -hmm. it, it comes down and, it, it, you know, there was talk about like activist fatigue or, or whatever, anti-racist mm -hmm. fatigue and sort of it's too much and I just want to move on to the next thing now, mm -hmm. right? Um, and during that time, I was asked a lot around like, are, do you, do, like, are you hopeful now? Because this is the biggest protest that, you know, we've ever seen and people are really interested and people are having this conversation everywhere. So does this give you hope? And what I would say repeatedly is that it, it, it's on white people and people have white privilege to give us reasons to have hope through their actions, not just through what they say, not just through the books they read and the podcasts they listen to and the, the classes they sign up for, but how does their behavior change? Does, is there change? And that can't be, um, that can't be judged now. That will be judged mm -hmm a year from now, two years from now, three years, 10 years from now, and so on. Mm -hmm. That's when we see that. So my um, job is not, to, is not to say to people who have white privilege, you have given me hope, or I hold the hope now for you. So you can breathe a little bit easier because I'm holding hope. No, my job is to really dedicate myself to an internal sense of joy and liberation and healing and to, um, cultivate it and nourish it and support it in other people from um, black and brown and people of color communities, right? And so that's what I'm seeing more and more and more. It's kind of like white people, people have more privilege, you, you got to do your work and we're not here to kind of hold you to it. That is a you thing, right? That is a you thing. We can't wait um, for you to get it in order for us to feel free. And so that has been mm -hmm. the biggest thing for me that I have experienced myself internally and that I'm seeing with so many people. Mm -hmm. And it and that gives me hope because it's not about getting to a destination of a post-racist world. Like that's not a that's not a destination. That's not a place that we can say we have now yeah. entered that world. It's actually a state of being first. Yeah. And so we have to be it first now. And so that for me is 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 really. Is a, is a wonderful win that I continue yes. to live into and that I believe is um, helping us to move towards that state that we want to be in, in a way that really grounds and centers us. Wonderful. I'm here yeah. for it. And um, last, uh, maybe it was 2020, um, we hosted some, I will call them now courageous conversations. I'm reading the uh, abolitionist handbook from Patrice Cullors. Mm. And mm -hmm. just, taking my time actually with just that alone. What is a courageous mm -hmm. conversation? And um, I actually used your chapter about optical allyship mm. to really just ask the community of children's music makers, like, is this making you feel good? And if so, investigate it. Mm. What is it? What are the feelings? Why does it feel good? Why? Right. Are, and at what cost is that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I really appreciate that framework from you right now for just kind of the the planetary energy of humans yeah. who have been um, in this uh, struggle and in this um, space of freedom for many years. And yeah, um, in my college years, I was a scholar in Afro-American studies at Harvard. And 
I remember battling with it. Like I felt, I felt a longing for that joy actually. And I'm, I'm just, uh, even as a white bodied person, just, I was like fighting and fighting the system and this and that. Mm -hmm. And then the, the place where I found the joy was in music. It was yeah. and yeah. poetry yeah. and movement. And, mm. and it didn't matter if it was in, you know, was it Cambridge, Massachusetts or in Cape town where we, me and my best friend mm -hmm. went, it's when we danced together, mm. we were unstoppable. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, like, what are, if you might want to share, like, what is a place where that joy is just accessible to you right now, even if we can't mm. be in the community? Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for sharing that so much. I, I love that you shared about optical, optical allyship, because I mm -hmm. think that is a different experience for adults than it is for young people. I think that the way that it, it shows mm. up, I, I mean, I definitely wanted to include it in the book so that it was really clear this isn't a tick the box kind of thing this isn't about just feeling good about yourself this is really about creating change but I think with adults it can be so insidious of this mm. performativity of I want to be seen as a good white person because mm -hmm. I actually do feel so much guilt and so much shame about this privilege that I have and uh, if I can just do something that shows other people you know mm. um then I'll be okay. I can, I can remove that feeling, right? Whereas for young people, the actions they take may look performative, but that's because at that level that they're at, that's the power that they have at that stage, right? And I think where, as an adult, you might say, well, they're just, they're just trying to show the other Black people and Brown people in their lives that they're quote-unquote woke, for young people, it may be they just want to show the other kids in their class and in their schools, I see you. Right. You're not alone, right? And also that part about feeling good as well, that can be really insidious as well for adults because it's about, like I said, alleviating that pressure, feeling a sense of um, white saviorism, Yes. right? Feeling a sense of, I did the right thing. I rescued, right? These poor mm -hmm. people. With young people, it is, um, it, it, it's important. I feel it is very important to ground them in a sense of, um, we're talking about wanting to change the world and make the world a better place. That is about love and that's yeah. about joy and that's about hope. And that should feel good. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't feel, it shouldn't feel shame. It, it shouldn't be about shame or guilt or fear, right? Um, not to say that those emotions are not valid or not a natural part of the process, but they're not the fuel. Mm -hmm right? They're not the things that are going to make it sustainable. And so for me, um, just to come back to your question, and I think this is applicable to both adults and young people, where I get joy from is in community and with the people who I love and who love me, right? And, and when we talk about community, I think sometimes we think, oh, we have to be part of like a large group, right? That's mm. what a community means. I'm a very introverted person. Um, <laughs> I'm happy here in my in my office in my journals right i'm i'm very much a family person you know i'm happy just me my husband me my kids right i know who my people are i have i have um really good friends really good um uh relationships with people who i choose to be in relationship with whose values are the same of, as mine and who are really about living from that state of freedom like internal freedom and that's what gives me joy because it's a reminder, hey, the world out there is pretty scary. And there is so much to be, there are so many, so many fires that need to be put out. And there's so many reasons to feel um, outrage. Mm -hmm. And there is, and, and with the world that we live in with technology and social media, there are, our buttons are constantly being pushed. And there is a constant, um, undercurrent of wanting to use black bodies and black death to keep this conversation going right and not focus on black joy and black liberation and so i love that in my intimate relationships with the people that i love we're just about gassing each other up you know we're just about making each other laugh 
we're just about having those deep one-on-one -on -one conversations about the possibilities of, oh my gosh, we could create this thing and this mm -hmm. is how it would help people. Um, and, and, how can, and how can we bring more people along and how can we make sure that we're pouring into the people um, who most need it? Like that's what really, really fills me up. And it's this reminder that culture changing and, and world yes. changing isn't about standing on a stage and, and you know, preaching at people and declaring to people. It, it's really about how you live your day-to-day -day life yes. and the intentionality that you pour into your relationships and where you choose to place your energy. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And I love that you, you um, turned it into a circle instead of that triangle of, of mm -hmm. control and so mm. forth. Um, and I wanted to touch in on educators role with your book, because we did um, talk about that, um, the complexity of who teaches and just yes. how many conversations you can start. And um, I wanted to share as a um, white accomplice, um, a pro black liberation centered thinker um, who's been very much shaped by black American authors in particular over my mm. lifetime, that I think humility is one of the biggest gifts one could bring in the role of an educator of the I do not know. Um, yeah. And I receive your truth. Um, mm -hmm. And so I wanted to just share that as you bravely offer this book globally to classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just saw that Scotland, Scotland, the country <laughs> has ordered <laughs> young adult copies of me and white supremacy for every high school student. Now, when I say yeah. that, I see culture change. Um, right. Can you share like, what do you envision for, and that's actually my ancestry is yeah. from Scotland. Um, mm. And so I, I traveled um, mm. there and it, it was an interesting echo. Um, I know the expression of blood memory, um, which mm. has mostly been talked about within um, African-American experience. And for me, I had a, an experience of, am I here now? listening mm. to people play music, but there's not a conversation of anti-racism. So it's like part of me is here mm -mm. and part mm -hmm. of me feels mm -hmm. like this is mm -hmm. uncomfortable for me mm -hmm. um, to be around so many white people. But <laughs> mm -hmm. tell me like, what do you imagine? What do yeah. you imagine with this? Well, first of all, I want to shout out. Um, so the, the campaign that you're talking about was a campaign started by Lighthouse Books, which is a radical bookshop in Edinburgh. They are amazing. Cool. Um, I got the chance to visit the bookstore and do an event with them as part of my uh, adult Me and White Supremacy book tour in February of uh, 2020, mm -hmm. again, before the pandemic. Um, and when this book came out, they took it upon themselves. They said, we, we want to start a... Um, we, see, we have a vision of putting this book into every high school in Scotland. And so we are going to start a crowdfunder campaign to raise the money to do that. And so they did. And um, thanks to the very generous, generous donations of so many people, they were able to accomplish that goal. Um, not only that, they, you know, they, they made it um, with time to spare. And so they were like, what if we could also put it in every library in, in Scotland wow. as well? So that's what they're aiming for next. Um, and that's just incredible. And when I, when I was told about it, it really brought me to tears because that is, that is culture making. That is saying mm -hmm. it, it's on us. We can do something. Um, we will and I do often something. think we will do something. <laughs> and I often think about the, um, the power of ripple effects mm. and the power of when one person says, I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to put this thing out there. Um, and you have no way to predict who might be impacted by it and how it might change someone's life. And all of us have an experience of at some point in our life, whether we were young people or as adults, coming into contact with a book, with a movie, with a, with a, pl uh, a play, with, with something, mm -hmm. um, a song, something, right? That just shifted the paradigm for us and shifted how we saw, uh, how we saw ourselves, how we saw the world, what we saw as possible, what we saw as um, necessary, right? And it, and it shifted our, the way that we showed up in the world. 
Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I always get like goosebumps, you know, whenever I think about this idea and this philosophy of being a good ancestor, because again, it just takes one action. It just takes one conversation. It just takes one decision. And you can have this ripple effect that goes far beyond you. And, and that's what I always want to encourage people to do is to just act from where you're at right now. From where you're, you're at with, with the influence that you have, with the power that you have, whatever that is, right? The power that you have is maybe the conversation that you're having with your two-year-old and your five-year-old, right? Or, <laughs> yes. or you're a teacher in school, or you work at a, at a, at a company, or you're running a business, right? Whatever it is, or you're, you know, you're part of a book club, whatever it is, you have such, you have such power and you have such influence and choices like that to say, hey, I think I'm gonna do this thing and I, and I will do it and let's see what happens. It, it's just incredible to me. And I think it, the more of us that can do that and can see, can see world changing as something that is uh, that is our prerogative mm -hmm. right it's on us right wherever we may find ourselves to do something um the, the more the world can change and I think young people when you speak to them about this like they get yeah. excited about it yeah you know they're not they're not scared like no. they're like what can I do yeah I want to go to that thing yeah I want to start yeah. that thing you know and that that is very exciting to me I love that. Um, change the world. Let's just sit with that for a second. Um, mm. You talked about in 10 years, we're going to see the ripple effects of, you know, the collective efforts of the community of artists, activists and the activists themselves. Um, mm. What what can you imagine for us um, globally, just mm. even as a feeling or call in something? I know you're a very um, visionary manifesting mm. um, woman right now. So what's mm. something you'd like to call in for 10 years now for all of us? So I was, um, I was in a conversation recently um, and uh, the person shared something from someone else that said that the work that we're doing is actually about becoming healthy human beings. Mm. And that really struck a chord with me because I don't think we necessarily think of it as that. We think of it as anti, anti-racism, anti-oppression, and like mm -hmm. we're always fighting something, right. but we're seeing it as something that's outside of ourselves and not, not in ourselves that is making us unhealthy and unwell. And so I see us, I, I really took that. I really like internalized that. I was like, yeah, I want to, I want to, I, I want to be healthier, healthier in my relationship with myself, the way I speak to myself, the way I think about myself. And, and I want to be in healthier relationships with other human beings. And I want our mm -hmm. systems to be healthy and how it takes care of us, all of us. Um, and so that's what I'm seeing for the future is not so much the monster will have been defeated, right? The thing that we're fighting against will have gone, but actually society will be healthier and that health isn't just about how we look you know and our fitness no. it, it's actually about right it's These so much deeper and white supremacy mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm talking mental emotional yes. spiritual health Care. relational health yeah that's wonderful mm -hmm. um we uh one thing that I've gone on as a, in an evolution of offerings, uh, with my co-creator, Tommy, uh, Soleti Shepard, who I also co-created the book, you are not alone is, mm -hmm. um, you know, we started with like, let's make racial justice music accessible to children and families, but from a place of, um, uh, black agency in the voice of it and not mm -hmm. translating for white, um, voices. So yeah. I'm an accomplice and not at the center. So I want to just, mm -hmm. just, I'm speaking today. Um, and from there, we wrote The Love, which was just really listening to our gender diverse community of kids and families, mm -hmm. um, expanding our own ways of showing up, um, mm. breaking up our own, healing our own gender trauma. Mm -hmm. um, this is like big work to do, and you can start it at any, any time. 
Yeah. And I think it's really prepared us for what we, uh, and I just want to share my 10 year vision, um, which is really about the health and wellness of uh, restorative practice. Mm. Um, and I talked about this with you a little bit about parenting and how, yes, mm. anti-racism, it's an, a daily action and you can step forward and back into it, right? That's right. But our yeah. parenting work is, um, it's so vulnerable. Mm. And I have been working on control. Why do I feel like I need to be in control? What is mm. that about? What does it mean mm. for my two children who are um, Indian? Uh, my husband's uh, Indian, uh, second generation American. Mm. And what does it mean for them to watch a white woman be in charge, right? It, they, mm. They're not thinking it like this. I'm mom. No, but right. These are important pathways that right. it is my responsibility to mm -hmm. interrupt. So mm -hmm. that's something in 10 years, I want to have that to sense that as a part of daily practice, not just in, you know, my small little community of my family, but also in the way that I, we receive one another. Yeah. Um, acknowledging one another's point of view, we don't mm. have to be right. But if we've caused harm, we yeah. need to be accountable to ourselves for it. Yes. And that is a place of possibility for me. I've mm -hmm. witnessed that so much in practice. It's such an intimate space. It does not need to be public. Right. But I, I hold a lot of curiosity yeah. for what that looks like. It knocks down that optical allyship. It knocks down mm -hmm. the presentation of self that we have to do in these social media frameworks. Or yes, right. It's like it's really looking at our, our connection. And, and it's like through this apocalyptic times, like we see each other. And we love, it's really that radical love. That's what I'm, I'm calling it. Yeah, that is beautiful. I talk about um, accountability in the book um, because I feel right. it's really important. Yeah, I mean, in the adult book, it was the chapter on, you know, being called out, being called in, right? Yeah. Um, and I think at the time that I was writing you know, creating me and white supremacy and writing about that. That was this a huge thing. Who's being, who's being <laughs> called out? Who's this, this person needs to be called in all of that stuff. You did and I think work about... that was like, forward. <laughs> I mean, now, did well, you I know? Think, I, yeah. <laughs> I think about, um, I think about young people being on social media. Mm -hmm. I think about the fact that we were not on social media until we were adults. Right. And right. it's, and it's hard for us to navigate. Um, and I don't just mean like the logistics of it, which is, <laughs> I was still trying to figure out how to do a reel, right? Um, but not just the logistics, but also it's, it, we're communicating differently now. And our relationships are via these platforms and the way like our human behaviors are being played out in this space, right? And where it's, it's, it's not been the norm to be able to have access to everyone all the time through most of human history. So mm. this is like, our brains are just like not caught up with right. how fast the technology is going. So you're putting these technologies into the hands of young people, which at this point is pretty inevitable, right? This is not a judgment on that at all. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's inevitable. Um, and at some point they're going to get onto these social media platforms and they're going to witness the very same things that we are witnessing, which is people being called out, mm -hmm. people being, um, uh, pe people being harmful, yeah. uh, people reacting just like that, uh, you know, a mob mentality, all of that stuff. And they have to make sense of it. Is this the is this the right way to do this practice? Is that what this is about? Is go mm -hmm. find everyone who's not practicing anti-racism, anti-oppression perfectly and call them on it. Right? Is is that our charge? And so I really wanted to address this in this book because I wanted to talk about accountability. And I say that the first person you have to be accountable to is yourself. It's not about I, I need to go hold other people or other people are coming for me, yeah. right? Are you accountable to yourself? Are you, is the way that you're behaving, behaving in alignment with what you fundamentally believe mm -hmm. is a correct way of being, right? Mm. It, it, the, the values that you hold around kindness, around l being loving, right? Is that showing up? And if not, that's that's a chance for you to have that conversation with yourself. Right. And then how we hold other people accountable 
is not it's not punishment. It's not about punishing them as a person. It's about understanding their behaviors and calling them into a conversation around that if they're open to it. Um, but also, um, but also being real and saying some people are not going to want to engage in that. Right. Right. And that doesn't mean that you then resort to attack or that you just give up and become apathetic. Right. We still keep going. Um, and so I felt that that was a really important conversation to have. And I think for all of us, we're trying to navigate that because that's the real work is, mm-hmm. is, is, is how do we, how do we call out the systems and the behaviors that are harming us? while at the same time holding on to our humanity. Yes. Holding other people's humanity too. And not um, trying to build, trying to create liberation from a place of punishment. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, so it's, it's we're trying to hold everything at the same time. We're trying to make yeah. sure we honor people who have, who are being harmed while at the same time understanding it's you don't it, it, it's not about doing unto them and that's right. the way that we're going to get to so it's it's a it's a lot but it's important and the and the important thing is as well is that we don't have all the answers we're still figuring it out mm-hmm. and what you were saying about parenting and teachers and mm-hmm. and everyone who's in any position of authority or power mm-hmm. oftentimes our desire is I want to have it all together. I want to understand it completely. I mm-hmm. want to be the expert in this. So any question or any situation that comes up, I know how to handle it. Yeah. And that, like you were saying uh, earlier, is a function of white supremacy itself. Yeah. Right. And so we we have to allow ourselves to be truly vulnerable. Yes. I, I really appreciate that because <clears throat> I am a, uh, I used to have a very rigorous to-do list and you know, you start down a path and if you don't complete it, then you haven't done your job. And Mm -hmm. when you start in, when I started investigating perfectionism as a part of white supremacy, I let go of some of it. And I think parenting Mm -hmm. helped me do that Mm -hmm. because I was just messy. Um, But Mm -hmm. beautifully, I'm not saying that as a derogatory. Um, Mm -hmm. You received the information you wanted. It was misspelled and um, Mm -hmm. I typed it while I was breastfeeding and Mm -hmm. I love you. (laughs) Like, and this is generosity. Right. Participation mm-hmm. is generosity. Yeah. Um, I did want to speak to um, generosity as a part of that accountability. When mm. um, a, a black woman, an indigenous person, person of color brings forth something to somebody who's causing harm, white person causing yeah. harm or whomever, this is an, I, I see this as an act of generosity. Absolutely. Because that is a gift to say absolutely i'm giving you my time time right and my knowledge because right i believe mm-hmm. you can do better mm-hmm. and so i invite folks into that space if you are feeling shame what a moment mm-hmm. of generosity that you get to read a book in yeah. your precious time that you can do better mm-hmm. um and so yeah, i say to, yeah <laughs> i say too um so the the way that the book is structured you know um unlike the adult edition, which was purely for people who have white privilege, the young adult edition is for all kids of all racial and cultural and ethnic backgrounds. And so I had to structure the book though, in a way that acknowledges that depending on whether or not you have that racial Mm -hmm. privilege, your experience is going to be different and your responsibilities are going to be different, right? And so in the reflection, uh, recap, reflect and um, respond section at the end of each uh, chapter, um, I often give them different advice on what they yes. need to do. Not always, but where it's relevant, I give them different advice. And something that I explain to you know young people who don't have white privilege is it's, you don't have to explain yourself to anybody. You don't, nope. you don't have to teach these people. You know what I mean? Like you don't, that's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to be fully you right? Your responsibility is just just shine and be a beautiful, wonderful self. And they have to go do their work. If you want to, then that's good, you know, but it's not a, it's not a, it's not a prerequisite. And if you do make sure to take care of yourself while you do it. Beautiful. Right. Cause I became yes. clear on my journey of this work 
when I started very early on, I very quickly um, uh, was on a path of burnout mm. and self-destruction mm. because I thought it was my job to help white people figure it out. I mm. thought it was my job and this is me, this is me still, I hadn't yet fully understood the ways that white supremacy had mm -hmm. was doing its job on me mm -hmm. and how I had internalized a sense of inferiority. And so I was making myself the, um, I, I, was, I, was, I was not being of service, I was being a servant, mm. right? And, and so I was giving away my power every day. I was literally giving away my life force energy. And I see pictures from myself at that time and I look like a zombie. I don't, I don't look like me at all um, because all of the internal life force energy had gone because every day I'm having long conversations with white people online, back and forth, back and forth, trying to prove, trying to explain, trying to show, trying to guide. Um, and at some point I came to the realization, oh my goodness, if this is the model, this this is this is fundamentally wrong because if mm -hmm. this is the model for change this means that black people brown people indigenous people people of color will have to self-sacrifice their life force energy for people who have white privilege to to just get it not not to create change to get it right mm. to to maybe be open to the conversation to maybe be wanting to go down that path of exploration um isn't that just white supremacy? Yeah, that's labor. labor it, it's, it's more than yeah. that. It, it is, it is, it is self-betrayal. Mm. It is self-destructive. Um, it, it is, it is self-dishonor, right? And so my, you know, the way that I do this work is that's why you don't, that's why you won't see me give a, hey, I'm running a, a me and white supremacy class because for me, that is not that is not the way that I am here to do this work in a way that honors me, hmm. right? I'm not built for those classes. <laughs> I'm built for teaching other things, and I'm cre currently creating courses on other things that I think will really supplement this work um, and helping people to become good ancestors. But I can't I can't stand for days in a room and teach white people. Good, but I can put it in a book and really do in-depth research, storytelling, everything to bring it together and say, hey, I made this. Mm -hmm. Now you go do your work. Thank you for mm -hmm. just all of the envisioning, uh, the rigor, the self-love, mm -hmm. um, the accountability, and the offerings that you continue to pour into our global community. Um, I think I just wanted to express again gratitude for your honesty and your heart and um thank you and i wanted to see if there was an offering you'd like to share as we like move to questions mm. um is there would you like to share anything that you're on the precipice of or yeah just like lighting you up Ugh, right now? yumminess just yumminess so i um obviously the young uh, uh readers edition of this book has just come out so and and that was it's been an incredible journey writing it um, it took two years to write it um, because it was it was quite an emotional process, mm. to be quite frank. It wasn't so much the logistics of how do I write this book, though that also took time. But it was the emotional journey of writing mm. it. It was my inner child healing, and it was it was like you said, coming back full circle. Mm. Um, and so you know, when you're a writer, you, you you're in your internal period and you're creating, and then you put it out into the world. And you got to speak to everyone about it. Um, but I have been working with the Me and White Supremacy work since 2018, when I started the Instagram challenge and then created the workbook and then created the adult book and the journal and now the young adult uh, book and, and a journal will be forthcoming. And I feel really complete in this work, Caitlin. Yes. yes. I feel I have honored the work that I was called into I feel I have put my gifts to use as a writer and a, and a learner and a thinker and somebody who um, really wants to contribute something that can, that can be life-changing and world-changing. 
and I feel really complete in this. And so um, I will not be writing another book <laughs> for for white people on anti-racism, right? <laughs> because Celebrate I think that, that I've done my my part there. And I feel like I said, when you feel complete in something, it feels yes. good. There's no regret. There's no, there's just like, yes, that was good. And I'm so happy I did that. And now the expansion and the evolution is this work of becoming a good ancestor. Yes. Right. It's again, it's not what we're just what we're fighting against. What are we fighting for? Yes. And this bigger question of what does it mean to become a good ancestor is a question that I think is going to guide the rest of my life. Hmm. And so I'm currently in the process of building a company um, that brings together the podcast that I run, the book club that I run, and my experiences and my excitement as a teacher to create courses and digital programs that will help people deepen into that. And so the first thing that I'm creating at the moment for this year is work around how to use your voice to help change the world. Because when That's we think good. about, right? <laughs> when we think about like, who are the good ancestors who have influenced you on your journey, which is a question I ask all of my podcast guests. Yes, they'll, they'll talk about their grandmother and their aunt and their grandfather, but they'll talk about the writers and the yeah. speakers and the activists and the people who use their voice and them using their voices was this activation. And I'm so clear that yes, it's important to do the internal work, which isn't performative, isn't for social media, isn't, it's you and your journal, it's you and your tears, it's you and your relationships, right? But to then activate to that next level, to go from the personal to the systemic and institutional change, will require us to use our voices. Mm -hmm. And there are so many things that get in the way of that. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that get in the way of people feeling confident to do that, feeling courageous in doing that, feeling clear in what they wanna say and how they wanna say it. And so that's what I'm, I'm excited to be teaching on. So that's the precipice that I'm sitting Love on. Love it. It's exciting, that. yes. Wonderful. <laughs> um, I feel so grateful to have spent time with you today. And I also feel very in tune um, mm. as we prepare, um, to run a workshop on finding your brave voice this weekend with the group yes. of writers here in Oakland. Amazing. Um, so it's funny how, um, and I, I think that is our ancestors at work, um, yes. connecting us. Um, I feel very fortunate knowing, mm. knowing you just even in the short amount of time and through the legacy of your writing to inform how, um, I am in the world. So I give thanks and, um, mm. I love that. Thank you so yeah. much for sharing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's see if we have any questions from our lovely listeners and let's give thanks to Rory and Selena for um, ASL translation today. Thank you, um, Rory and Selena. Let's see. There is a question from Noel about um, the current iteration of the Me and White Supremacy Young Readers Edition. Um, mm. Is there a plan for a workbook or are there current works we can be connected to for infant to early education kids? Oh, okay. So there will be a, um, so there's a couple of things. There will be for educators, there'll be an educator's guide for anybody who wants to use it in the classroom. Um, and that has been written by an educator, not by me, <laughs> but by an educator. Um, there will be forthcoming a guided journal as there, will, as there was with the adult um, edition. Um, as I said, I feel really complete in the work. So I will not be doing another iteration of Mean White Supremacy. But what I am really excited about as well is that there are now so many forthcoming resources and, and books that speak to young people. And so I've included some of those in the resource list in the book itself that specifically speak to young people. Um, but I would also say, uh, one of those that I'm, I just wanna shout out is Tiffany Jewell, whose book, um, Anti-Racist Kid will be coming out. Um, so Tiffany is the author of this book is Anti-Racist, which to me is like, when I was looking at like, how can, like what other resources are there that I can draw on? Tiffany's book was a major one for me. Nice. Um, so she has a book called Anti-Racist Kid, Anti Kid that's coming out. But I've included some resources in there. And then I would also highly encourage following, if you're on Instagram, following The Conscious Kid. They are always sharing such important and wonderful books. 
um, uh, for young people uh, and great resources for adults and educators. Um, so there's, there's lots out there. And also, you know, follow the work that the Alphabet Rockers are doing as well, and Caitlin. Thank um, you. There, yeah. there are so many wonderful people doing doing great work. Um, this is a time in the in the in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, where there's a lot of fear around um, giving these giving this knowledge to young people, giving them these resources, giving them this understanding, and so we need to be actively disrupting that. So if you're a parent um, or you just have young people in your life, um, you know, be, subvers be subversive, right? Unapologetically. Um, <laughs> unapologetically, yeah. get them those banned books, talk to them about these topics. Don't let what the schools are saying should be canon, should be what's taught, be the thing that shapes the young people in your life. Right. They deserve so much more and they are, um, and you you talked about this, Caitlin. I'd love to, for you to share this, but they are capable. They are very capable of holding it. Yes, the they are very very capable. Our children um, mm -hmm. don't already know these things to be true. Is is actually based on uh, fear and uh, white nostalgia, um, mm -hmm. and nostalgia itself of well, I didn't learn this as a child is a is white supremacy at work, locking you into a pattern of repetition that Absolutely. what I had is what needs to continue and. The biggest invitation of this lifetime and multiple pandemics, as um, my dear friend Jillian, who will come to her question next, um, comments is that there is an opportunity to let go of everything that you mm. thought was serving you and really dial in on our collective good, our collective yeah. health and wellness. Um, it is not enough to take care of your own family. We are interconnected. Mm. Mm. Um, and I want to just say, yeah. sorry, because um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about teachers as well and, yes, and, the, and, and how they can be subversive in these settings as well um, for, for teachers who have white privilege, really using, using that privilege here. And then also really supporting black teachers and teachers of color, um, because this is, I, I can imagine, I just, I, I can't imagine being in that situation and being told, I can't teach Toni Morrison, right? I can't, I can't teach, um, I can't teach about gender difference. I can't teach about, you know, this country's actual history. You know, I, I cannot imagine. And so please support black teachers and teachers of color because this is a lot. Thank you. Um... One uh, person, uh, I want Jillian, I'm going to give your question to the end because it's about joy, but there's another person mm. named Sharon who asks us about um, the parent perspective, having mm. conversation as a family, and how do you suggest bridging these yeah. your two copies um, into family mm -hmm. discussion? I actually think mm -hmm. that's beautiful, and I think that's an opportunity too for like podcast exploration, I was going to say, of like how we share and listen to something together. Together, um, right, you know, right. And how do yeah. we... Um, we're and our children are going to have ideas that help us like yeah. it's not a pass down it's actually a circle no yeah so that conversation between the two first of all is that it's an ongoing practice as opposed to a one-time conversation or a series of very serious conversations it's an ongoing practice um that um it, it, it's about finding ways to integrate it into how you live and, and what you talk about. Um, and I think it's, it's regardless of whether or not you have white privilege, at a minimum reading the adult edition will, will help make you so prepared for holding the space for the young people in your life as they're reading their edition. Also, and you said this, Caitlin, and I, I knew this was true when I finished writing it, the young adult edition is actually really great for adults too. Yes. It is. There's a lot in there that wasn't in the adult edition. And I think yes. that there's, <laughs> I think it's actually really great for adults too. Yes. So I will say that. I will say this mm -hmm. for, for folks, um, white supremacy thinking that like more years means like, you know, more better. experience. Right, so right, right, right. Why not be innocent and say, I'm listening and I'm open. Yes. That is the place yeah. to come from for like yes. true embodiment. And yes. when I read your um, young adults, and actually right now, I just want to give thanks to all the folks writing critical narratives for young adult readers, because yeah. this is exactly what we need. Imagination spaces, yes. like seeing ourselves yeah. winning, 
um, but knowing what world we're in, not just like being cast without who we are. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, so I, I just, uh, I totally love that. Um, this yeah. book is here for us. Um, yeah. So the, last, the last question for us is how are we finding joy in the dance mm. of authorship, change making, mm. and motherhood? Mm. During intersection. I mean, all, all of those things are joyful pandemic. to me. I mean, <laughs> All of those things are joyful to me oh, and they weave. Yeah. I mean, they weave in and out of each other. Um, I was, uh, I was very flattered recently when my daughter told me that for world book day, which is coming up, um, their theme that they've been told is about change makers. Mm -hmm. And so she's decided that she wants to go to school as me. And I'm like, don't cry, don't cry. <laughs> You know, but it's like, wow, you know, um, this thing that I'm like, that I shut myself away in my office and do, right, and work on and then get to have that conversation with them. And they get to tell people like, my mom does this. And isn't that awesome? And then that we also just have a regular life. Mm. Right? I think that's, uh, it's, it's wonderful. And I, I'm very, very, I, I, I have a lot of joy in my life is what I want to say. And I'm very grateful for it. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, the last thing I would say about joy is new practices, um, mm. interrupting patterns. We always did this on this day. Do we need to right now? Maybe that's right. Maybe there's another opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. Last night I lit my full moon candle and put water out to receive the moon's energy. Mm -hmm. This is not something I did a year ago and now I receive mm. it as a time of renewal. So, right. Thank you so much. I Layla, love that. And thank, thank you, you. Um, Allison, for inviting me to be in this um, triumphant space. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.